preach many things here at First Baptist Church, all from the Bible. We will not preach anything better than understanding the gospel of Jesus Christ. The fact that Jesus came to this earth and lived a sinless life. That he was buried, he died on the cross for our sins, and was buried and rose on the third day, according to the scriptures. There is nothing greater. And listen, if you come to First Baptist Church, you'll hear me talk about the gospel. Sometimes you may even ask yourself, why does Pastor mention the gospel so much? And it's because I don't want someone to come to First Baptist Church and to not know about Jesus Christ. Now, we'll preach this morning, and, and it's not about the gospel, though it still kind of touches us through the gospel, but I don't want someone to come here more than a couple services and not hear that Jesus Christ loves them and he died for their sins, and if they ask him for forgiveness, he will grant them forgiveness of sins. You know, there are many churches that do not preach the gospel. Even some that claim to preach the Bible, and you will go there and never hear the gospel. They just assume everyone is saved. My friends, I tell you what, Jesus Christ died for the unsaved, and there's probably those here this morning who don't know Jesus Christ. And I don't want you to live one more day apart from Jesus Christ. If you have your Bible, so let's open to Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27 in your Bibles. We've been going through the book of Acts. If you don't have a Bible with you, it'll be on the screen. And also, there's a Bible in the pew in front of you. I would encourage you to use that Bible so you can follow along. If you don't have a Bible, you can take that Bible home with you as well. And if you're using that Bible in the pew, we'll be on page 1,329. Page 1,329, it has been a privilege to have given away many of the Bibles in the pews. Many people have taken them, and I am thankful for that. I, I want everyone to have a Bible that you can take home, you can read, follow along as we look at the sermons and, and the messages from the Word of God. The Word of God is something that is eternal. I get to hold something eternal in my hand. The Bible says heaven and earth w will pass away. But God's word will not pass away. This is, this is eternal, my friends. And that's what we look at this morning. Acts chapter 27, as we pick up again in the story of Paul, as he is on this boat, headed toward Rome, and he is in the middle of a gigantic, a ginormous storm. This apparently is the storm of storms, the storm of a century. And we will find out today that the ship that he is in will be utterly demolished. This is a storm. But God has done something powerful for Paul in that he has offered safety and security and promises in the middle of a storm. And I just happen to believe that the same God that helped Paul is the same God that you and I serve, and he still promises security in the middle of a storm. Now, our storms in life may look different than the storm we find here in Acts chapter 27. You may own a boat, and you may have been caught in a storm. I don't think anyone here has been shipwrecked before where your boat has been demolished, but maybe it's happened to you. But the storms that I'm referring to are the storms of life that threaten to shipwreck our very existence. And where we're tempted to think God doesn't care, God's not here in the storm. God is above the storm. He could help me in the storm, but he kind of is just sitting around up here doing whatever he does while I'm suffering down here. And my friends, nothing could be further from the truth. There is a phenomenon that they've identified in the last 20 years or so. And they, they use these letters to identify it. F. O M O, FOMO, or fear of missing out. Fear of missing out is where we observe what others are doing and think because we are not doing those things that we have missed out. We see what their kids are doing and we think our kids are missing out. We see what they have gotten what their accomplishments are, and we compare them to our accomplishments and what we have gotten and we have missed out. And there is a fear of missing out. Vacations, achievements, promotions, even as simple as someone who has gotten a better deal than we've gotten. Fear of missing out. Social media has not helped this, but exasperated this concept. Social media, you look, and, and without social media, we still we have the same fears, but 
you see, wow, this husband posts, look, look what my wife just bought me. She just bought me a brand new boat. And we think, well, my wife didn't buy me a brand new boat. Look at my husband just did. He just upgraded my ring from a one and a half carat ring to a three million carat ring. Well, there's a picture enlarged by Photoshop on there. It's like, wow, can you even wear that thing? Do you drive it to work? Look at my kids just got us. Our kids just bought us a brand new house. You look at your house, you're like, my kids are costing me my house right now. The list goes on and on and on. And we fear, we experience disappointment, discouragement, and discontentment rather than recognizing what God has done for us. We look at others and we compare, and the Bible says comparison is terrible. Comparing themselves among themselves, they were not wise, or basically when you compare, you're nothing but a fool, the Bible says. We think our lives are puny, small, empty, mediocre, and insignificant. And others appear to have lives full of joy and contentment, blessing upon blessing, love, everything we wish we could have. And we fail to realize, we fail to understand that a life with God on our worst day is better than any life without God on their best day. That one day in the storm with God is better than receiving any ring, boat, house without God. And here Paul, in this experience, I believe is going to teach us something. With the help from the Lord, we're going to look at a text this morning, and then in the afternoon service when we head over to my house after church, and I hope you all come. I hope you all come over. You're going to have a great day over there, Lord willing, beautiful weather. But we'll, we'll look at another passage inside of Acts chapter 27. But if I could direct your attention, please, to your Bible, to Acts chapter 27, verse 40. If you're using the Bible in the pew, page 1,329, beginning in verse number 40. And then we'll pick up the story of Paul in the storm. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea. Now just think about that. We pulled up the anchors, and now they were at the mercy and whim of an ocean. Maybe you've never been in a shipwreck, but perhaps you've been in a storm or been in tumultuous waters in a lake or perhaps even on the ocean. And very, very quickly, if you've ever been in that situation, you realize just how insignificant you are. If you've been in a, in a place with a three or four foot, even three or four foot waves, you realize that there is nothing you can do to stop these waves. Maybe you've played on the beach and, and some one or two foot waves have come in and they bowl you over. And then you look and this summer we were up in the Upper Peninsula, I saw a picture up at the Sioux, Sioux St. Marie, and they had a boat and they had 20 plus foot waves coming over, washing over this gigantic tanker. And some idiots had taken some pictures of it. Men, no doubt. But you realize just how puny you are. And here, these, these seasoned sailors, this accomplished captain has now said, there's nothing we can do except give ourselves to whatever the sea does to us. We can't fight for anything. We can't defeat the winds and the waves. There is nothing we can do. They have now committed themselves unto the sea. They loosed the rudder bands, the Bible continues, hoisted up the mainsail to the wind and made toward shore. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground and the fore part, the front of the boat, stuck fast and remained unmovable. But the hinder part, the back of the boat, was broken with the violence of the waves. So these waves were so violent that they tore this boat clean in half. They destroyed it. This was not just like you skipping a rock and making a few little ripples in the lake. This was not just you jumping and cannonballing into a pool and splashing someone outside the pool, a little bit of water. These waves were violent. This was a violent storm. This was tumultuous. This was life 
threatening. Verse 42, and the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. Now understand that in Roman culture, soldiers were responsible for their prisoners. And the law was that if they escaped, it was a life for a life. Remember when, if you remember, you're here when Acts was, I'm sorry, when Paul uh, was in the jail, the Philippian jail, and the doors opened, the jailer was going to kill himself. Because if one prisoner escaped, his life would be forfeit for any prisoners. And so here the soldiers are thinking ahead, listen, these guys, these are deadbeats. These guys are criminals. They're the, they're the, in their view, the worst of the worst, the worst of society. They're going to stand for crimes they've committed. I'm going to end up back home with my wife and my children. I'm not going to sacrifice my life for these, for these bunch of hooligans. And so rather than risk them escaping and Rome finding out, let's just kill them. And they would have been justified in that. They would not have been charged with that. They could have done that legally, all right, in that judicial system of Rome. Yet, it doesn't happen. Verse 43, but the centurion, willing to save Paul. All these prisoners were spared death because of one man. One man had an impact on everyone else. He kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which should swim, could swim, should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land and the rest, some on boards, and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. Let's ask the Lord's blessing. Lord, we thank you for this time, and I pray that you would help us in the next few moments. Lord, may our hearts be encouraged and challenged. And Lord, I pray that if we find ourselves in comparing, in comparison to others, rather than looking to you, Lord, I pray you'd convict us today. Lord, that we would come humbly back to you and you'd forgive us for the times that we look around instead of looking up and resting in you. Lord, bless this time and I pray that if there's someone here who doesn't know you as Savior, that today they would turn to you and receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. Lord, we love you. We'll give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Here in our text... We have an opportunity for the disappointment, for discouragement and discontentment. But what we'll find is we'll find that if you follow God, you can find joy and contentment. I want you to notice, first of all, that God's word was unhindered. That God's word was unhindered. If you have your finger here, turn back, hold your finger in Acts chapter 27, and turn back to Acts chapter 26, the end of the chapter. In Acts chapter 26, in verse 32... The Bible says, Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. Earlier in the passage, uh, Felix will say, You've appealed to Caesar, so to Caesar you will go. Or in essence, the ruler said, the, the governor there said, You're going to go to Rome. And at this point, they were definitely not headed toward Rome. The wind, the storm had made it impossible for them to continue on that journey. Now, they will make it to Rome, because of what God says, but at this point, they were going toward Rome. The, the ruler, the governor had said, take these prisoners to Rome. But because of the storm, they were not going toward Rome. If you were to look at a map like I did, and you see where this storm came, it seriously sidetracked them. And they were not only going toward, not toward Rome, they were caught in a storm. But remember, God's word is unhindered hindered, even when man's word is hindered. And though the ruler said go to Rome, the ruler had no much more authority over the storm, all right, than a butterfly to make you change your direction. Not only did the ruler say go to Rome, the captain said it would be safe to go to Rome. If you look in Acts chapter 27, in verse 11, where the Bible says, nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship. The owner, the captain, had said, listen, there's no problem. There's no storm coming. We'll be okay. And he was wrong. Because the experts aren't always right. If nothing else, don't miss that today. Experts aren't always right. God is better than any expert. God's smarter than scholars. And so the ruler, 
all right? The authority had said go to Rome, and he couldn't make him go to Rome because the storm came. The captain said, oh, it's safe to go to Rome. This is the path we'll take. Now they're in the storm, and they ain't going toward Rome. But God had said they would be fine and that they would get to Rome. You know why they'd be fine? Not because of a ruler, not because of the captain or a scholar, but because of God. Because God's word is unhindered. But they were still in a storm. They were still in a storm. You ever find yourself in a place in life where you know that God is still there, but you're in a storm? And you're tempted to think, but God, did you not know there was a storm coming? You were caught off guard, but God's never caught off guard. You see, God had said that everyone would be saved, that no life would be lost in the storm. God had promised that though the ship would be lost, nothing else would happen. And in fact, we find out in verse number 44 that they all escaped. They escaped all safe to land, the very last portion of this chapter before chapter 28. That God, it happened just as God said it would because God's word is sure. In verse number 41, we find out that the boat was utterly demolished just like God said it would be because God's word is sure. My friends, God's word is unparalleled. God's word is unmatched. God's word is not like man's word where it's temporary and hopeful at best. God's word is secure. God's word is steadfast. God's word is a solid rock, the rock of ages. God's word is a mountain that cannot be moved. God's word is a tree that will not be toppled, the tower that is strength and assurity. God's word is sure. And you and I have the word of God. This is the strength in life. Put down your phones. Turn off Fox News or whatever your poison of choice is. And look at the rock of ages. And let it bring you security in life. Others will say, this is going to happen. And God says, no, this will happen. And guess who's always right? God's word. Others will say, nothing bad will happen. It's safe. No storm will come. And there's going to be a storm. And God's word is secure. The word of God is a light to guide you, a counselor to counsel you. A, comfort, a comforter to comfort you and a staff to lead you. And a sword to defend you. God's word is a mind to enrich you. A robe to clothe you. And a crown to crown you. God's word is sure. And in this passage, we must identify the fact that God's word is unhindered. And it's still true today. God's word will be unhindered in your life. It's true. It'll, it'll happen. If God has promised to save us, he will save us. He will. We can rest secure. God's word is unhindered. But this morning, I want to point out something that we struggle with. God's word is unhindered, but God's help is unequal. God doesn't help you the same way he helps me. God didn't help these individuals in the boat the same way he helped the other ones. Though God's word was unhindered, though God's word was unmatched, God's help was unequal. Well, that's not fair, Pastor. Who said life had to be fair? Seems like that's the first lesson to learn as a parent. Life isn't fair. If you don't have that down, you're not worth your weight in salt for mom or dad. God's help was unequal. Look, please, at verses, at verses 43 and 44. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which could swim could cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. And the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. God's help was unequal. Not everyone got to safety the same way. Not everyone got to land with the same operation. Not everyone got there at the same time. Notice, first of all, that God, to some, he gave some of them strength. Those which could swim cast themselves first into the water. 
Now remember, the reason that these soldiers, the reason that these prisoners, the reason that these ship men were saved was not because of their strength. It was not because of anything they have done. The only reason they're saved is because God's word is unhindered. And God said they'd all be saved. So God commanded 276 people, all saved. The only reason they're saved is because God said it would be. But then when it comes down to it, they had to swim. They had to swim. Now, it would have been nice if God had teleported them. Can God do that, yes or no? Absolutely. Have I ever seen God do that? Nope, I've read about in the Bible where, where Christ teleported himself, but I've never seen teleport people. But he could have. God could have picked up the ship, put it on dry land, right? My friends, God did that with Noah's ark. God put, God put that boat on dry land right where he wanted it. So he could have done that to this boat again, but he didn't. He let the ship be demolished, and the first instruction was, if you can swim, get out the boat and swim. You know, sometimes God just provides strength to live another day. But you know what? That's not good enough, is it, my friends? Because some people got boards and some people got broken pieces of the ship. So while you're swimming and you're tired, you look around and you see Brother Treadway floating on a, on a board. You'd be on a board, no doubt about that in my mind. Now, why does he get a board? Here I am swimming, barely above water. Maybe you're doggy paddling. And there he is kicking back, drinking a Diet Coke, floating toward shore. We look around in life, don't we? And though God has promised something, we look around and say, well, why, why do I have to work toward the shore? And he gets to float toward the shore. Brother Ashley, he gets a broken piece of the ship. Maybe puts a flag on that thing. And we're tempted to think, I don't think God's very fair. And then we think this. The only reason I'm getting to shore is because I can swim. Because I'm strong. We put something stupid on social media. God gives his toughest battles to his strongest servants. It's baloney. It's baloney. Every battle we get is too much for us. And they didn't get to shore because they were great swimmers. Because they were Michael Phelps of, of, the, of the boat of that time. They got to shore because God said they'd get to shore. And the first group that went to shore got to swim. They got to swim there. I've shared this maybe two other times, but when I was in college, I got to work my way through college. My parents helped out some when they could, but I got to work my way through college. And my friend, he got a board. Because he went to his post office, boxed out a check for $10,000. Me? Me, I had little old ladies on Saturdays who I'd go weed their garden for, and they'd give me money. And I'll tell you, I'll be honest, there were times that I wish I had the check in my post office box. Why does he get the board, and I got to swim? Why do I got to swim? Here I am, trying to thank my parents for a hard work ethic, when really what I want to thank them for is a trust fund. See, sometimes God's greatest help, his greatest help, is strength just to survive today. Because those men, those prisoners, those soldiers, those ship sailors did not get to the shore by themselves. They may have thought they were swimming in their own strength, but they were swimming under the mighty hand of God. And maybe, just maybe, 20 years earlier, one of those little ship boys, Peter perhaps was his name, got swim lessons. Why do I have these swim lessons? Because one day God's going to use those swim lessons for his glory to save you, help, help you be saved. Not everyone gets there the same way, but they all got there. And sometimes God says, I'm going to give you the strength. It's still his strength. And when you look around, you say, well, it's just me. No, my friend, it's not me. It's not you. It's him. It's him. Well, sometimes people got different opportunities than we get. 
They get the boards, 10 feet, 12 feet. What a great way to ride the waves in. Maybe on the boards they were just praising. But we never know the rest of the story, do we? We never know why they could only ride a board in, why they couldn't swim. We don't know. Maybe they had no legs. We don't know. We just know they couldn't swim. Because if you could swim, you got to swim. We don't know what their life story was. We just know they didn't have the strength to swim. And we look around, we want to compare and say, boy, I'd love those opportunities. But my friends, we often don't want to endure the pain to be in that place. We don't want to lose the loved one to have the strength over here. My friends, we look at that and we compare and we're foolish in our comparison because others get opportunities that we don't have and then others get the scraps, the broken pieces, something small to cling on to. They couldn't swim so it was scary, holding on for dear life. And you know what I imagine? That if they were discontent, all three parties can be discontent. Why can't I swim? Why don't I get that board? Why can't I have that, that scrap? Not everyone got there the same way, but they all got there. And not everyone got there at the same time. There's some faster swimmers and some slower swimmers, are there not? Those boards floating in and those pieces, they're floating different times. And we look around and we often wonder, well, why is my problem still going on why am I still in the waves, the violence of the waves, when they're already on land safely? How come they get to get there first? How come their prayer's already been answered, and I'm still on my knees begging God to resolve this, begging God for relief? Why doesn't God answer my prayer as quickly as he apparently answered their prayer? You see, they didn't all get there at the same time, did they? They couldn't have. But they all got there. They all got there. Because the point was not for it to be the same. God did not say, I will save this whole boat and everyone will arrive at the same time in the same way. The point was that God would be glorified. The point was that God's word would be unhindered because regardless of how they got there, regardless of when they got there, everyone got there. My friends, I want to encourage you this morning because in our life there's going to be storms. And God's promises are still true. Someone did a study on the promises in the Bible. Now I want you to think for a moment. Don't answer out loud, but I want you to think for a moment how many promises are there in the Bible. Don't answer out loud, but get a number in your head. How many promises in the Bible? I believe there's about 31,000 verses in the Bible. 66 books. Someone did a count of the promises in the Bible, and they came up with this number, that there are 8,810 promises in the Bible. Now, some of those promises would be uh, to a specific person. Remember when Peter was in the boat, and, and Jesus said, Peter stepped out of the boat, and Peter was promised he could walk on water. You and I don't have that promise. I have a pond of the house today. You're, you're welcome to try it, but I, I don't think you're going to have success in that. That promise was for Peter. Well, the pastor said it was a promise splash. Other promises in the Bible were, were given for perhaps specific locations or peoples, groups. But there are thousands of promises that are just given to the child of God. The promise of salvation written before the foundation of the world. The promise of forgiveness of sins and those who will repent and seek his mercy. The promise of guidance. The promise of strength. The promise of peace. And over and over and over again, we can reap the blessings of the promises. But my friends, as you reap those blessings, understand this. You will not always get the promise at the same time the person next to you will. It will not always look the same as the person next to you. I had a buddy when I first came as assistant pastor to First Baptist Church. He was a buddy from college, and he called me and said, J.D., you won't believe what happened. He said, we were praying for a house. He said, a lady from church walks up 
and said to this youth pastor, I want to buy you a house. I was hoping someone would feel led today. He said, when we got to this house on the counter, we had a set of keys for a brand new minivan in the garage. Now, you know how hard it is to, to rejoice with someone else at that moment? No, it takes a lot of grace from Jesus Christ. You understand what I'm saying? That's tough. Another pastor, a friend of mine, we took over the church. The first Sunday, a man walked up to him and said, Pastor, I want to bless you. Gave him a check for $100,000. That's ridiculous. 50 is fine. <laughs> and my friends, I stand here and God's never failed me yet. I am blessed. I am, I am more than blessed. I have way more than I need. God's promises don't always look the same. And we get in trouble when we begin to look around and say, well, that's a promise from God. Why didn't mine look the same as his? Why didn't mine look the same as hers? Why wasn't my healing the same? Well, why didn't God take the cancer away the same as he did for them? Why didn't God heal the relationship with my child as quickly as he did with them? And not all things are the same, and not all things happen at the same time, but the promises of God are still just as powerful and just as good. Today, I want to encourage you to trust the promises of God. Maybe today you're swimming to shore. And you look around and your other Christian friend you know, they're floating on a boat drinking a pina colada. And the other person over there is cleaning a broken piece and you, have to sh and you have to swim to shore. My friends, God's promise is still good. God's word is unhindered and be encouraged in the Lord. Don't be encouraged because you have a piece of a board and, and they have to swim. Don't be encouraged because you're on the shore before them or don't be discouraged because you're still swimming or you're still floating or you're still clinging. God has promised what he has promised. And to these men, to these soldiers, to these prisoners, to these sailors, God had said, you're all going to make it safely. And they all made it safely just like he said. But it doesn't always happen the same way. And it usually doesn't happen at the same time. And yet we get discontent. We get discouraged. We begin to complain when we take our eyes off the promises of God. That phenomenon, fear of missing out, FOMO, has now grown. Now they have a FOMO mo, fear of the mystery of missing out. They have MOMO, JOMO. It's a whole list of them now. Let me just help you what it is discontentment. Russell Carter was his name. At 15 years old, he gave his life to Jesus Christ. At 15 years old, he asked Jesus Christ to forgive his sins. And Jesus Christ granted forgiveness and offered him a home in heaven. Over the next 15 years, before he was 30, he became an instructor at an academy, a coach, an ordained minister, also finished his degree to become a doctor, a medical doctor, and on the side, became a musician and a songwriter. Very accomplished, successful. But at the age of 30, he was diagnosed with a critical heart condition. At 30, they said that he would not live more than a year. And Russell Carter said he would trust God. Another teacher who was instructing in the same college he was at said this. She said, Russell Carter, he knelt down and he made a promise that healing or no, that whether his life was finally and forever over or not, 
that everything he did be consecrated to Jesus Christ. And he would just trust God. She said in her perspective that at that moment, the life of Russell Carter, her co-worker, took on new meaning and looked different. She said he couldn't believe how he began to lean on the promises that he found in the Bible. Wouldn't that be wonderful? If we could do that before it was a life-threatening situation, if we could do it before the storm, if we could do it in the time of plenty, in the time of blessing, to say, God, I will lean on your promises, not question your ability and your goodness. Perhaps most important was commitment to believe God, whether God healed him or not. It's during this time that he wrote a song. You may not know Russell Carter, but if you've been to church a few times, you probably know the song. The song has these words, standing on the promises that cannot fall when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God, I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. I love the second stanza where it sounds like this. But I can just imagine Russell sitting in that room. Who knows if he was swimming, holding onto a board, or all he got was a scrap, a piece of the ship. As he wrote these words, standing on the promises, I now can see perfect, present cleansing in the blood for me, standing in the liberty where Christ makes free, standing on the promises of God. Can you hear Russell that day? Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, I'm standing on the promises of God. And last stanza. Standing on the promises I cannot fall, Listening every moment to the Spirit's all call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God. So today, maybe you get to swim. Maybe you get to ride a board in. Maybe all you get is to hold on a broken piece of the ship. And not everyone got there at the same time, but everyone got there. And not everyone got there the same way, but everyone got there. Because the promise of God.